Welcome to the Throw Show. Everybody, buy cues and corrections. All right. Is that is that is that a good want? plug? Is that what we want? Is that how you're supposed to plug? <laughs> is that what you're supposed to do, Jason? <laughs> that's all I guess. I, th- I think that was good. <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, so we we did release a book called Cues and Corrections: um, Fixes to Common Technical Errors. And so, what we ended up doing at uh, Throws University is. Trevor and I will frequently be standing out at the shot circles and just always sort of having like, hey, you know, this person does this. What do you think about X, Y, and Z? And he and I will sort of feed off of each other with these these technical cues. And, and when we see errors, and even today, you know, you bring in Keeley's video over and then I might say something about Rachel or whoever and, and yeah. just going back and forth. And so what we ended up doing is is – we sat there like, hey, why don't we come up with a book where it's very simple, where you have pictures of a, of a mistake at the top, then the the correction at the bottom, and then on the on the right side would be three cues on how to how to improve um, how to improve the the actual movement that we're looking at. So it's very uh, applied and very practical, and it's all stuff that he and I have uh, played around with a lot over the last year um, and experimenting with different athletes of, of all sizes and capabilities. So, so if you're one of those coaches that wants to talk about how you can't do certain things because that person has height or this person can't do this because of their levers or whatever your excuse is, we cover every size, shape, um, male, female, Actually, I think there might be more females in here than anything, but because yeah, um, they take corrections a lot better than males do, because they actually listen uh, and don't come <laughs> up with stupid ideas in their head in the middle of a throwing session. Um, but so we put that together. Um, I mean, I did most of the work. <laughs> <laughs> no, Trevor did most of the work on this. I feel like you do most of the work anyway. But yeah, well, it is all stuff that we're we've been. I mean, it's it's both of our ideas and it's stuff we've been, you know, tossing back and forth, talking back and forth with each other, you know, through basically the last what probably goes back the last eight years, eight nine yeah, years since, that we've actually been like right, you know, I'm figuring mean, all this out. Yeah, but um, but yeah, one thing also with this book is that it's it's all it's tangible stuff. Like it's not. We don't use like weird words that just we came up with, and it's just in our system that if you'd hear it, you would have no idea what oh, we're simple. talking about. It's just like all applied stuff, and yeah. I think really it's dude. I, I mean, I've had ridiculous feedback from people. I mean, on mm-hmm. throws you people have messaged us. Plus on on my own personal account, all people be like uh, the coach at uh, Christian Brothers Academy at CBA. He's like, dude, that book is unbelievable it's like mm. going to practice and just holding it up and watching somebody yeah yeah which is a really good social media post that i thought about and never actually did um maybe i'll do that tomorrow with rachel <laughs> yeah uh, but yeah so it's, it's back in stock yes yeah, back in stock it's at throwsuniversity.com you can get it in the digital form or you can get it in hard copy and if you're in southeastern pennsylvania you can pick it up at garage strength and i am going to be presenting at the Wisconsin Track and Field uh, Coaches Association uh, seminar clinic in next weekend, man, next weekend I'm going to be presenting, and I'll have um, hopefully at least two dozen copies with me there. So, yeah, um, if anybody's interested, you know, message us, comment anything, and then and we'll get you the book. But it is available online, so buy it if you want to throw far. If you want to have throwers throw far. <laughs> All right, let's get into the right. let's get into the meat. I was gonna say we, I don't even know if we have to go over Callis's, uh podcast from last week. Now that we yeah. did that, unless yeah. you unless you want to, um, other than pal- Callis is crazy. Yeah, if you want to be entertained, if you want to be entertained, follow strength athletes. John's a lunatic. He's one of the best training partners I've ever been around, and he is uh, one of the most genuine dudes that you could ever meet. And so John Callis was on our podcast last week. We were going to go back over that a little bit, but I think because of the cues and corrections plug, that was so spectacular. We can get right I into it. I say we get into it. Yeah. So we had questions yesterday on our, um, on Throws University. <clears throat> well, 
it was sort of like Trevor said, hey, why don't we get some ideas from you guys and from our, you know, people, our followers and see, mm-hmm. you know, what you guys want to hear us blab about for 45 minutes to an hour based off of our supposed expertise. Yeah. Yeah. So I basically just pulled out a couple questions. Um, some I kind of combined, some I just took straight up, but um, we'll go through these. And our idea is that we'll go, um, we'll give each of us a certain allotment of time yeah. to answer the questions. And then, so it'll just keep it moving. We'll hear both of our perspectives and then. That way yeah, Trevor we'll doesn't on ramble on one. too much. So yeah, that's typically I, I, what happens. Right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> but the first question is peaking. How do we... We're going to do peaking right away? I guess peaking should be like the last <laughs> thing you do, I guess. We peak our athletes in the beginning of the season, though, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. I mean, based off of how far they throw, that's the way it looks. <laughs> um, okay, this is a better question to start so with. We'll so like, let's say peaking for the end. Okay, all right, all right. Let's go. <clears throat> all right, this is good. How to prepare for the season. Okay. So we're a little bit into the indoor season. Two some, minutes. Some people don't start until... The spring, Am which I is a mistake, a but start. Uh, yeah, sure, start. Okay, yeah, two, two minutes All for right. you. Yeah, you can. St- and you two can, minutes for you. Yeah. All right. And you do, you do your little preface there after two minutes starts. Ready? All right. Go. All right. So what is what is the actual start of the season? It should be in July, how I see it. Like, if you're preparing for the season, this the season starts. Yeah, and right. for everyone. I mean, you should. Like I harp on this all the time is that too many people don't do anything until like December when the first meet is, but really your season has to start in the summer. You know, maybe you take a couple weeks break after the season ends, but it's got to start right away. You got to train year round. If you want to be good, you got to train year round, throwing year round, lifting year round. And that's how you prepare for the competitive season with that practice season starting in the summer. Um, but what you need to do is you need to take a lot of throws. You need to throw minute 10, five, five to six days a week. You need to be taking, if you're a shot putter, 20 to 30 throws a day. If you're a discus thrower, 30 to 40 throws a day. Um, and throwing a ton, working on technique, making those technical fixes in the off season so that when you get to the actual season, now they're probably going to still be things to fix, but you don't need to make those giant, um, like a couple steps back, you know, a couple steps forward mm-hmm. um, changes right during the season when you want to be throwing far every week. Um, and I mean, so throwing and then you got to be in the weight room. You got to be lifting for at least four days a week um, and, you know, making those strength gains off season. Um, and we'll get into, there's another question also in season, but um, <coughs> yeah, that's what I got. Good. I just want to point out that I was, I didn't talk for a minute and 45 seconds. I think that might be a record. <laughs> Dude, that's definitely a record. <laughs> so mine's three minutes? No, two. <laughs> I'll, you, I'll, I'll time it. Oh, come on. You think I'm going to cheat that, man? <laughs> All right, ready? Yeah. Okay, so I, I would, you know, I would agree with Trevor for the most part, except my problem is that I don't think anybody should ever stop training, and, and that's my overriding problem is that, I remember Peyton told me, she's like, oh, I'm going on vacation to like Virginia Beach. And I was like, why? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's my problem. But here, here's a good example is that this is what I, I decided with Sam this year. And I would say, especially with high school kids, if you have two to three weeks where you do almost nothing, twice a year so two two weeks where you do next to nothing and then later on in the year two weeks where you do next to nothing but it's basically especially if you're in high school and you're playing multiple sports you should be lifting and and doing technical work and if you're in if you're in you know the summertime and you can't you can't throw as much as as you should which you should be throwing five days a week working on technique and having technical models that you that you are focused on you should be lifting preparing for football season or or whatever you know whatever that fall season is 
but then you should be studying, you know, technical models and trying to figure out and visualize and learn how to make yourself a, a more advanced athlete at a very young age if you're a high schooler. If you're a post collegiate or you're a collegiate athlete, you should be you should be focused on training all the time throwing wise. You should always have um, models in your head, visualization in your in your mind and and before you go to bed when you wake up and trying to feel these different throws so that when the season starts, you're prepared mentally, but you're also prepared for for how you're going to learn and then you start to make those technical changes early on. And when you start to make technical changes early on, you start to grasp how to change and then how to fix the rhythm and throws and how long those those changes might take to be implemented into your into your technique. So I I I would just say train all the time. Look at that, 2 minutes. All right. <clears throat> Why don't we go? I think this one kind of leads into um lifting in season. Okay. It's like a question like it's I mean, I'll kind of make it partially into should you lift in season? And well, who's asking if we should lift in season? What I'm telling you, there are people out there that don't lift in season. A lot of people. Really? Yeah, I I bet there are. I'm sure there are. And then, okay, but the real question would be, what should you do lifting wise okay. in, in season? Okay. Um. But what should we do? A minute here? Yeah, that'd all be right. good. I got you. All right. So, go. First of all, yes, you should lift in season. That's without a question. <clears throat> you can't like. And this also goes into like a lot of people, whether they lift in season or not. So they do lift in season, but week to week they have meets and they take Thursday and Friday off lifting every single week mm -hmm. because they want to try and throw far in the meet, which they have every single weekend, pretty much if you're in high school or college. Um, and I think that's a mistake. You should pick out maybe three meets that you want to throw far at. And really for those first two meets, you're only just going a little lighter on Thursday and Friday in the lift. And then on that big championship meet, that's your peak meet, then you can taper down and go, you know, pretty lighter, more specific stuff. And, you know, just not as much volume in the weight room um, or hardly any volume at all on that, that last week. Um, but you should be lifting during season. Um, Time's up. Four days a week. <laughs> all right. Dane, go. Okay, so I, I would 100% you should be lifting all the freaking time. Whether it's really heavy or not is dependent upon what we just talked about, what Trevor just touched on with, with competition. I always think the first couple of meets throughout a year, you should be going ham the whole week because what ends up happening is you might lift really, really heavy for the first full two weeks, but when you're going to compete and you haven't competed in a while, you're going to be so juiced up at these comps that – it doesn't matter if you're really sore. You're gonna you're gonna be amped up to compete really well. Then there's always gonna be one meet where you might train through it and you still throw well because you have good technical feeling. And then you know the whole goal is that you unite that the the weight room with that the the technical peak and and experimenting throughout the season is important. And again, with what Trevor said is that you've got to pick one or two meets that you you can just sort of be a wash, and then one or two meets that you want to peak at, and then the rest of the season you just basically train through done yeah um <laughs> all right now we'll go into this question is making progress when you don't have a coach is this a, this will be a 10 second one no. <laughs> uh i um do you want to start with this one yeah i'll start with that okay how, how long should we go minute and a half Ready, go. Okay, so this I think this is uh, pretty practical for me because the last um, two or three years of my career, I, did, I didn't have a coach. And I think that, uh, again, I sort of wish that Throws University existed then. Uh, one, for myself, because I would have been a better – I would have had a better mindset training-wise. But two, because I would have had somebody as a resource to use. And I think that that's the most important thing is that – You've got to always check yourself as an individual. So I just decided that I'm going to try and back squat 220 for a set of 10, right? So the first person I talk to is is the mobility doc. And the reason why I'm going to talk to the mobility doc is I want him to assess my squatting pattern so he can really decide, like, hey, this is where you're really weak. This is how you got to target this stuff. And I think that that's, that carries back into throwing clearly. If you don't have a coach, 
you don't want to program everything based around your strengths. You want to program everything around your weaknesses in the beginning of the year and even through the middle of, of the season. But then on top of that, you've got to have uh, a technical check on a regular basis. I would say minimum of once a week, hopefully twice a week. And that's where Throws University can come into play is that we're offering you know these technical analysis that you can buy. You, you can even get training programs that we design um, and, and are extremely successful. So I think that You've always it's okay to train by yourself. I think it's really good for you as a, as a competitor, but you've always got to have an external check whether that is some online coach or it's just something as simple as buying a technical analysis. I think it's it's pretty easy. Done. Good. <clears throat> Ready? All right. Cool. So, I I trained my last two years at college without a technical coach on site. And now I did have Dane as a resource um back then but he wasn't there i was training you know whenever i was at college i was i was on my own but i think that actually i i threw so i threw two meters further in those two years i went from 16 to 18 meters without a coach um and what i what i truly think is that that not having a coach kind of it was either a sink or swim sort of dynamic that happened is like either you got to step up you got to find what motivates you and what your goals are and you got to decide if that's something you actually want to do or not and if it is then that's going to be the motivation whatever whatever that goal is in your head that's going to be the motivation that's going to get you out to train hard every day without someone keeping you accountable um but i think if you don't like if you don't have a coach you got to find some sort of resource on your own you need to hold yourself accountable or find a training partner if to hold you accountable so that you get out there every single day to do your training because it's real easy when you don't have to do something to just say, you know, oh, you know, I'll just take I'll just take today off, you know, whatever. I don't, I'm not feeling good. I'm just going to take today off. It's like no, when even if you're not feeling good, you got to get out there. You got to train hard. And it's tough. Like it's not easy, but there are uh, resources online you can use. I Thursday. I think to go on top of that I, I think it's not just about the accountability of what you're of actually going to training. It's also the accountability of following a full fledged plan, because just talking with yeah. a couple of these guys that have bought programs from us online, they they're so used to being like, well, today I'm just going to go into the gym and do this. And it's like, OK, so five days a week you end up just going into the gym and doing buys and tries and it's yeah. like no that's yeah, not yeah, how you yeah. become a world class or, or an elite high school thrower so i think mm-hmm. that that's yeah that's another aspect is it's just you're you're not going to go into the gym and just putts around and pick what you want to do it's it's a full-blown plan that you know you're the canvas and and there's somebody who's created it and and yeah. and, and you've got to follow it yeah. so and that's where i mean that's like stuff i struggle with and like yeah i I did write a blog on this, but one of my biggest problems too was just being like an absolute meathead in the circle mm-hmm. every single day, you know, just every single day valuing how far I was throwing and not actually what I was doing technically wise and just trying to smash every single throw. How bad is it that I already, in my mind, before, so before I talked to John about the squat thing, because I was like, I know my squats technique's terrible. Like, yeah. I just collapse, and I'm like, well, it's just because of my my build. Like I'm just I'm just gonna hammer through and just get stronger. <laughs> but then I'm like, dude, the best powerlifters in the world actually have really good squat technique. Like maybe I should try and fix my squat technique and then drink, <laughs> and then get stronger. Yeah. But then I'm like, ah, no, no, no. And I messaged John. He's it. like, dude, you could add 50 pounds of your squat just by not diving forward yeah <laughs> but that means you have to have technical training sessions with the squat and it's the exact same freaking thing for throwing yeah yeah all right <laughs> we rambled on that one that's okay yeah that's a good one um i feel like jason's been walking around the room for like the last 20 minutes breathing heavy on everything <laughs> All right. <laughs> now he's going to be over there slurping protein shakes <laughs> under the camera. Jason, were you throwing today? Yeah, he threw. I All coached right. him. Good. <laughs> Did you pay for that? <laughs> A little. <laughs> oh. Um, all right. Well, now we're up to peaking. I feel like we breezed through those questions. Oh, we're already to peaking? Yeah, I had five questions. Do you okay. want to go over any other? No, no, no. Actually, no, I have one more. I missed one. Um, that was only – we only did three so far. All right, how to stop fouling. <coughs> All right. Um, 
we could go glide, spin, and discus. Yeah. Um, let's go three minutes. All right. You or me? I'll start. I like going. I'll do peaking first. All right. <laughs> Ready? All right. So how to stop fouling. I actually don't think – I mean, it depends whether you get into it really technically or not. But I think the best way to stop fouling – and I'm, I'm guessing this is fouling in – a meet. And I think it's with a rotational shot, I feel like is mainly the problem for most people. Yeah. I mean, but everyone can have fouling yeah, problems. But yeah. um I so we like some people some people will foul all their training throws and when they get into a meet, they just automatically save them and they're lucky and it just works out for them that way. But most people they you know if you're fouling in training sessions there's a good chance you're going to be fouling in the meet as well. So the bottom line, just in general, a broad scope is you got to save your training throws and both save your training throws and set up like mock meets or say like, all right, the last five, six throws of the training session, I'm going to go harder. I'm going to treat this like a competition. I'm going to save the throws. Um, Now, sometimes, sometimes actually what happens is that if you're, if you're fouling all practice, it's going to be really hard to go back and start saving throws because you you already have the feeling of of saving of fouling all those throws already. So if you're really trying to stop fouling, I would start saving throws from your standing throw, from the first easy throw you take, slowly, slowly, slowly ramp up, taking easy throws, making sure you save them. Start going a little harder, and once you foul a throw go back a little bit take ease up a little bit save the next throw and just keep saving throws um and keep increasing the intensity as you go through the training session and i think if you if you hold yourself to that hold keep yourself accountable to saving throws and not going as hard as you can and fouling and if you do just just take it back a little bit i think that's the best way just from a general point of view to um to stop fouling now, with from a technical point of view, I think the biggest reason people foul is because they land on their left leg. I, I think this goes across every single technique. But if your body, when your left leg, left foot touches down, if your body weight is primarily on top of it, it's going to be very hard to save. You need to keep your weight over the le- over the right foot, the dominant foot, um, until your left foot gets down, and then only after the left foot gets down. Can you start to transfer forward, start to rotate forward, um, and put a little bit more weight on your left? But at that point, your upper body is already ready to release, and you can just continue that rotation around or in the glide that hang over the toe board um, and save the throw. Time. <laughs> okay. Ready? Yeah. Go. Okay, so I sort of disagree with Trevor a little bit on this one. I hmm. don't think that you should be saving throws in training. Unless they're blatant fouls. But I do agree, mock meets, I think, are key. I think one thing that I really like to do with, um, you know, with with the post-collegiate guys is that we'll sit there and be like, okay, let's go, like, six to eight throws, like, ham, and you try and save them. And what ends up happening is you have that very high intensity, um, those very highly intense throws. And I I try and think about... about, um, uh, almost like potentiation in the weight room. So they, they take these very high technical throws where they save, you know, six to eight throws. And then when they back off for the last five throws where they just get good technical throws in, their nervous system's wired a little bit higher and they're going to be a little bit more crisp and they're not going to be thinking about, they won't be blowing out of the circle. Um, I think the biggest thing that that is also based around fouling is that it's the fear of fouling like most things that happen in life are happening because people fear them and i think a lot of people fear fouling so they're they'll hit and they'll they'll change their finish so instead of finishing forward and using that left side and then rotating well they end up hitting and they'll jump and then they're off balance and they'll fall out of the circle and then they end up losing distance on the throw as well so i think that uh, and then they'll 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 be frustrated, and they're 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 barely going to make it into finals, and then they got to technically reach, and really push things on that third throw, and they might foul out or or not throw as far as they want to because they're pressing everything. Then, so um, I do like to to consider though that <clears throat> when you're training, that if you're a spinner, 
especially in discus or in, in shot, but mainly in, in the shot, that if you're going to come out, if you're gonna, if your left leg comes out, if you're a right-handed thrower, when you reverse, if your left leg just lands out, then that, that's a, to me, that's a meat save. If you're, if you rotate the left foot lands out, out, of, out of the toe board, that's a meat save. But if you're landing out and that right's coming out as well, and you're barely saving that right to stay in the circle, that's not something that you can save. So there's got to be something off technically. And what I end up thinking is that, um, you've got to be tighter out of the back if you're if you're a spinner if you're throwing discus, you've got to catch the shot back over the right or keep the discus back when the left is grounding. Use that left arm to open everything around on the finish. And what ends up happening is that if I'm a shot putter and I open that left, and this goes back to the throws you post with Krauser and all those guys catching the shot back over that right hip, the right foot. Mm -hmm. That when that left opens, you get a nice stretch and you can rotate out and then come back in because you're rotating so well. And that's one thing that we've got to hammer home is that it's a rotation. So you got to do that. If you're a glider, I don't think you should, you should basically be saving every single throw in training because that's your advantage is that you're going to get so comfortable chasing it out that you can still hang with that heel. And I think that all gliders should be saving those throws. So yeah, that's it. Time. <clears throat> good yeah i think like i think with doing the ultimate like kind of what i was going through a little bit is you've got a serious fouling problem in meets yeah. and like you can't figure it out then you gotta take that stuff you back. gotta yeah and that's kind of is like you have more high school kids and i have more you know college and yeah in post yeah, so it's like right, right. high school kids that are always fouling like you've got to be like all right i need to put a band-aid on this fast and yeah. i can't foul and a lot a lot of that too just comes down <laughs> to confidence too like if you're confident you can save the throw you know you're probably going to say it. it's the same thing that you're saying with like the you know afraid that you might foul it. I, like if you're confident you've you've been sa saving throws all the time and you're confident you can do yeah. it you're going to do it and i think what 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 a real quick cue could be is just making them do like no feet throws where they get to the front and they just stick it you know they stick it hard and then they get yeah. that feeling of being grounded now all of a sudden yeah. it changes their whole feeling and they they don't foul because yeah. they're not jumping out of the circle they're actually rotating and staying grounded yeah. and that's that to me you know, it's the value of what do you what do you want to value, and and for me in, in the rotation is that you do want to value that rotational finish, it, a, mm -hmm. a linear you know acceleration path. I'm still not sure the physics are, are accurate around having a linear acceleration path over a longer rotational acceleration path. I did want to talk about that today. <laughs> that really doesn't have a lot to do with saving a foul, but I, that popped into my yeah. head like over here. Yeah, I, wanted, I mean it does. I think like. If you think linear out, that means more of the energy is going to go out. Now, with the glider, that's okay because they can hang on the finish. Right. But with the spinner, if you go out, you're going to probably. This is what I always say. Do you ever have those foxtails? No. What so, are you talking foxtail about? was a thing that was like, it was Isn't a ball, like... and then there was this long, loose thing on the end. And you could go like this and then let it go, and it would just. You know, you could throw it you know, like my brother and I used to launch them like hundred yards. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe not hundred yards, but far. Yeah. And to me, that's what a spin is. Yeah. And it's like, if if I can do that, if I can rotate hard and then I can hit it, my energy's getting the shot, and then I just rotate back in. Yeah. Right. So the whole this goes back to the foxtail. You're not doing like this, and then on the last turn, making it a linear linear right, acceleration. Right. So that's it's it's the it's a tangent path. Right. That's where it's if you're rotating and something shoots off, it goes in the same path that it's correct. Bingo. It's going. Yeah. So okay. where's the where's that missing where's the missing link that people believe that you have to do this linear finish in the spin, like they call it linear drive or whatever. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Where's the missing link on them not comprehending physics? Yeah, I don't know. I mean maybe it's just that they think they can reach out further over the toe board, but yeah. I think you can do that and still be rotational. They're not thinking that. <laughs> what about a glide reverse for spinners? I think that's okay for you. Um, <laughs> I think that is actually a good way to start to feel saving it in the high school. I do think it's good for, for high schoolers to learn how to start to save their throw. And then what ends up happening is that that left leg will slowly start to they'll figure out what the left leg does in the save. Yeah, yeah. And they'll start to slowly stay grounded a bit more. Yeah. And that's a big problem, like, especially when people try and save throws, <coughs> usually they jump away from the toe board. 
but mm -hmm. with the glide reverse, you can feel the right foot going toe into board. the toe board. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's more comfortable to save it, and the, you can get that feeling of actually getting into the toe board when you, yeah. when you reverse. Yeah. Um, okay. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. What's next? All right, peaking. Now we're on to it. Okay. How long? Um, I feel like you could probably talk for 10 minutes on it, but... I could talk a lot longer than 10 minutes. Yeah, we all know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, five? Yeah, all right. And if I, if I feel like it's too long-winded... Yeah. Um, I, I've got, like, one thing I want to say, and then... What I'll is probably it? i just let you ramble. <laughs> I'll start. Why don't we just do five minutes of you and I... Okay, yeah, that works. And and I'll I'll talk about what what I like to try and figure out. Yeah, yeah. So I I think sorry Trevor, come on. Yeah. I, I I think that one thing I've been thinking about a lot and and this is there's there's so many aspects to peaking. There's there's the weight room, there's what you're doing as far as uh, mobility work, there's there's what are you doing as far as meditation or, or your mindset and your mindfulness. There's what you're doing as, as far as your technique and then what you're doing as far as like just rage in the circle where you cut off your head and just throw. And I think that having all those things line up and, and understanding where you know you are as far as the the best aspect or, or, or of each thing like some athletes peak very well still lifting heavy five to six days out you know some athletes peak really really well by cutting volume hard 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 for the last two weeks so their body can completely recover um and then and then on top of that you have some athletes that can lift really heavy but they can't take as many throws. And then the other athletes that you have to cut the volume back so much in the weight room because they like to take more throws in the circle because they have a better connection. And and I think that, you know, the whole goal of a coach is to try and figure out, like, where are we at with the weight room? Where are we at with the circle? Where are we at with technique? And then how are we going to factor in visualizing throws? How can you start to mimic what you're going to be doing in a competition in practice? So you start to visualize things. You might set the pace back a little bit more because that's how slow the meet's going to be when they're competing. Um, and you start to, to understand that. And one thing that I've even been thinking about, you know, with Rachel, because as we start to, to lead into like a small peak is that we're not going to do uh, lifts like single leg squats as much or, or, um, or step ups or anything because they just tear her up. She gets so sore and then she, she can't throw for two or three days. So, but the problem is that those movements really, really help her mobility. So from my perspective now as her coach, I got to say, okay, how can I make sure that that mobility is getting triggered and it's getting ignited so she can still hit really deep, nice positions with her hips, but not beat her up. And, and that's got to be factored in as well to, to how she's going to be peaking because that can, you know, that extra mobility might have a little bit of a delay on her recovery then because it's an extra stimulus. So those are all things that have to be fig you know, figured out ahead of time. And then you've got to start to figure out, well, what lifts do they, do they peak really well with? What lifts to help them throw the, the best, you know, what implements paired with those lifts help them throw the best. And then on top of that, you have to start to see what cues, you know, if, if, if I'm in a technical phase and, and we're just working on, you know, the left leg being the most important aspect of the throw for Rachel or, or, or Sam is a good example too. the left leg and that left arm being the most important aspect. Well, now all of a sudden, you know, is that going to be the best cues for them peaking wise? So it's like, you've got the, that might be the best technical improvement cues, but the best cues for peaking might be, yo, we get in the meet and you just, smash that right shoulder and if anything's off a little bit too much out of the back into the middle well then you just give them that one small cue so i think that there's there's so many different aspects that have to be factored into peaking somebody and this goes back to why you you should have a coach why you should have somebody who's who who can hold you accountable for all these different things because when all of them line up very very well that's when you see these people that are getting one meter PRs, one and a half meter PRs, you know, on the season best and stuff like that. Cause it's, everything's uniting at, at for one big, huge culmination of a monster throw, mm -hmm. but it's gotta yeah. be, you know, you've got to study your temperament and, and the athlete type and mobility and, and all that. And then the implements and, and what kind of implements impact the technique and, and speed and, yeah. and then the weight room. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think is it, and <coughs> like peaking is and like peaking in that competition is just the realization of training. Like everything that's built up, like you said, everything's built up, and that's just the realization, both physically and mentally, mm-hmm. of what of of what you're capable of going into the competition. I think I I absolutely think peaking and throwing far in your top in your most competitive competition of the season comes down to confidence. Mm-hmm. And now there are a lot of things you can do in the weight room, what shot you're throwing, different exercises that are going to make you feel confident because I think you feel confident when you're you're both fresh, you feel explosive, you feel like you have a lot of pop, um, you're not sore, you're not um, you're not like run down from training and that's where that's where tapering comes in into right. play where you have confidence in your coach and, and their ability to, to kind of periodize you and, and taper you in that, in that way. Um, and just confidence in yourself that, you know, that I've worked all season for this competition. I'm feeling good. I'm, I've been, my technique's been consistent over the last month mm-hmm. or even just the last week or even just the last, the last couple, couple days. days yeah. yeah. It's feeling consistent. And even if it's not, you still know right, and that, that and that's where and that's where the, it's the coach's responsibility to instill that confidence as well. Yeah, and that if they have you know making them realize that two days out from the competition they have a bad day, you know, okay, that's fine. You know, it's fine to have a it's yeah. fine to have a bad day. Like yeah. you're gonna have bad days every week. You know, and this is just normal stuff. And then but, that just goes back to but, what, what cues get you out of that rut. What cues get you? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And some sometimes it's just a funk too. Yeah. Even if it's the day before, you have bad throws, you can't feel it. It doesn't matter. That's you, go, you go into a competition, you have a completely different mindset. You have a yeah. completely different feeling. And you but think, as long as you're not doubting yourself and second-guessing stuff, you'll be fine. you're going to be fine going into it. Especially with 500 milligrams of caffeine. Yes. <laughs> no, and that, that's actually where, like, that's where I think, like, uh, superstitions and, yeah. like, those little the things. Mantras, you do it, rituals, the, the mantras, rituals. The mantras, the rituals. They work because you're. It makes you feel comfortable, yeah. and it makes you confident in what you're doing. And it that's, that's a lot of it's just a mental game. Dude, uh, Piros Dimas is one of the greatest weightlifters of all time. He sat there and he was like, you know, I've I've spent you know three weeks with this guy in a hotel. We've talked mm-hmm. about everything, and one thing he said is he's like, dude, every time I would go to a meet, I would take a. a rabbit foot that his daughter gave him when she was like four, <laughs> and I would take. And he, or he would take his other daughter's T-shirt and he would take them with him and he would hold them after weigh-ins. And he was like, I didn't think they were lucky, but they were from my kids. And yeah. that, that's what I was lifting for was for them. And he did it every single time. And he would eat, have chicken, rice, and a little bit of bone broth every single time after weigh-ins. And he was like, that's, but that was the ritual every single time. And I think that yeah. that's, that, you know, that, that has to be understood that you, these rituals are are effective or superstitions are effective not because because they're like luck but it's actually mm-hmm. because it's making you comfortable yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think sure. too one one thing i wanted to point out from the scientific side is that I, I think about this with rachel versus sam sam is a very for the most part technically sound or technically minded individual so he doesn't <clears throat> so if we would peak sam with like no feet snatches or no brush, no feet snatches. He would be okay because he likes finding the feeling, mm-hmm. and he likes to like have to make that adaptation to his body in a in a training sense in the weight room, mm-hmm. because that'll actually give him more mind control later as when he's in a circle because he's gonna feel strong. Like, oh man, I figured out you know no contact muscle snatch. Like I just PR'd that. It's a really technical lift, and it's it's subliminal subliminal, but it's still there. Yeah. Whereas someone like Rachel. If you throw a technical lift into her peaks, it could completely screw up her her technical set, uh, mindset in the circle, and that's people mm-hmm. don't ever talk about this stuff. Yeah, but it actually has an impact on, you know, her ability to throw and other throwers that we have, if they're doing very technical things and they're not technically minded, mm-hmm. or if they're doing non-technical lifts and they are technically minded. You know, you've got to. There's so many different characteristics and personality traits, but ultimately it's still, for me, it becomes you figure out as a coach, what is it that works? 
and f- throughout that year, then you you sit there and for that year, you're like, okay, these lifts are working this year to get them here. Yeah, yeah. And so it goes back to how can we make them feel strong on a regular basis or, or how can we get them, you know, and then it's a superstition almost as a coach. Yo, these lifts worked in the past. Yeah, yeah. They're going to work for them again because they're going to, they're going to do a behind the neck jerk with 210 kilos and they're going to feel like an animal. And then we're going to cut back and in two weeks they're going to throw big. And that's, mm-hmm. that's also part of that sort of uh, comfortable yeah, realization yeah. Of, of your training. Yeah. And, and it's not always <laughs> just like the coach figuring it out. It's like lots of times that's just what you talking to the athlete and listening and figuring out what they like to do. Yeah. You know, because a lot of it's just like, they really like this exercise. Put it, put it in their Cause peak. you're going to be in a better mindset. Yeah. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everybody's like they, all about they like reading to... these freaking books. And it's like, dude, just read your athlete. Stop yeah, reading yeah, your yeah. book. Read your athlete. Right. Yep. Yeah. That should be the title of this podcast. <laughs> but is there any other questions? Oh, 10 minutes. All right. <laughs> that, that <was> <laughs> um, I don't have any questions here. Are there any questions on there? I think there's no. only 17 people watching oh, us. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> um, so I, I want you to go first on the Red Hot Minute. All right. Can we put right. the flames up right now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I love that, that uh, one with Shago with the flames. That's yeah. cool. You know anytime someone says Red Hot Minute, the flames appear. Okay. Oh. <laughs> flames are coming. All right. <laughs> Damn it, I'm hot. All right. Oh, here. I, I got a question right here. Is I just got Luke? it uh, mailed in. <coughs> Cutting, <who>? Luke. Yeah. <laughs> Cutting weight before oh my God. in season for peak. He talks about this all the time. Please. For a peak? What are you, a sprinter? Like, no. <laughs> uh-uh. That's stupid. That can alter your energy. That can alter your, your power output significantly. I mean, what are we talking about? Like two or three pounds? Like, or are we talking like 10 pounds? That's stupid. There you go. That's so dumb. <laughs> Why would a thrower cut weight to peak? Like, the, what's the biological he, reason? The, his reason is he wants to be fast. So you get better technique. The whole purpose of having effective technique is that I can get to the front a little bit faster and I can accelerate the ball a little bit longer, a little bit faster to the discus. And that's what technique is about. It's not about gaining or, gaining or losing weight. Like, if, if you're going to lose weight, you could you could drastically decrease your strength, which then has a negative impact on your on your nervous system, because now I'm trying to cut weight and my calories aren't high enough. So I'm not recovering as well as I should be in training. And so then I'm not getting as much sleep because my body's stressed out. And now all of a sudden I just start this downward spiral because I want to lose weight. Dude, <laughs> sleep a little bit extra. Take some ZMA advanced, you cheap discus thrower and <laughs> have better sleep and that that's the most effective thing that's that's um what i was just i was just reading a, a study that i wanted to send you trevor was the two most potent um non-nutrition based things in training is actually water uh water consumption because a little bit a little bit extra water can you can fire a little bit more effectively not excess water but if you're a little bit more hydrated, so if you have a whole bunch of caffeine and then you add in a little bit more water, you, you can fire your uh, nervous system a little bit more effectively. But then the second one was sleep. Yeah. Sleep is going to make yeah. you faster than than trying to lose weight. Yeah. Because that's the stress of losing weight. Dude, especially when you first start to lose weight. Like think about people when they go on a diet. The first five days, you're like, oh my God, I feel like yeah. crap. That There's a reason why because you're – exiting homeostasis that's the last place you want to be if you're trying to peak you want to be in like the ultimate you know position of homeostasis homeostasis at least in my mind yeah luke he's probably so upset right now that you're, <laughs> you're roasting him <laughs> but good <laughs> so got one question that just came in uh would you bother peaking at all for indoors i for a post collegiate i i think I don't think you can like truly, truly, truly peak because you don't have uh, as of of you don't have as much of a base of training. I mean, you could you could theoretically have sixteen to twenty weeks under your belt by now potentially, um, but I would say comprehending that it's not like a true form of a of a, what I would call peak, but it could technically be. I would say that the reason why I don't get why guys aren't going to U.S. indoors or women. Um, 
the reason why I would say yeah is because you can make money. You know, you could win the NCAA too. And you could then, you know, think about you win the NCAA and the weight. Well, now all of a sudden you're going to get more money as a scholarship too. So it's sort of, to me, it's, it's, we're in a sport where these guys aren't making 500,000 bucks. You know, I mean, I, at least I don't think they are. I, I might, I could be completely wrong, but if I'm a guy who's throwing 22 meters and I'm only making a hundred, 150,000 bucks, I know that sounds like a lot of money, but over my lifespan, that might not be that much. So I want to take every single opportunity I possibly can to make as much money as I can off the sport because it's not its not like football. If football players can play 16 weeks in a row you know, and, and handle that on their body, then we can throw more frequently. And that's where I think I think you should at least be backing off and, and focusing a little bit on, on indoors. I also think indoors can kind of be a bit of a trial run too. Like yeah. if you do a, a mini peak for indoors, it can kind of be a trial run, see what works and that you can use in outdoors then yeah. too. <clears throat> mm-hmm. um, and I mean, it doesn't hurt. Like, you know, it just, it's, it's a little peak and that's almost like your little deload, you know, your little yeah. time off almost for right. before you get training in the, you know, ready for outdoor. Like, you know, almost treat that week, you know, you might go a little bit easier and then right after indoors is over, you start training hard for outdoors again. Right. I think, uh, it's, I think it's ironic because like, Sam and, and all the disc, discus guys, you know, they took off for about two weeks after Grand Valley. And we sort of use that as like a mini jumping off point where it's like, all right, let's train really hard all fall and then go to Grand Valley. We take two weeks off because they don't have to peak until July. So now they're in the programs and Sam's like, dude, what is this program? Like, you're killing me. I'm like, yeah, but you got to think of this program as like August or yeah. September because yeah. – now, now you're at that different point, but that's where it's like use use that as a test. And that's yeah. what it was. It right. was like, yeah. all right, Sam, let's do cluster squats on Monday, and then see what happens when you throw on Saturday. And he's still threw pretty well. Well, you know, not that we would do that outdoors, but we mm-hmm. we know going into a meet, you know, he goes to Long Beach. It's like, well, we can do cluster squats on Sunday, and and he'll be okay by Friday or Saturday. You yeah, know? yeah. So that's an, that's another aspect. Yeah. Okay, so back to the red hot minute. All right, let's do this. Now set us on fire for the second time. <laughs> I want fire coming out of his finger when he's pointing. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Jason. You can... All right. First question. Oh, that's so funny. I just pictured like a lightning bolt coming out of <laughs> uh, he's gonna, This is going to be like an hour of work just for Jason. <laughs> um, <Ten seconds. laughs> All right, here we go. Pigs or chickens? Raising. Dude, do you want to know a really weird question? A really weird aspect behind this? I have I have pigs or sheep for you. <laughs> <laughs> ah, pigs, dude, all day. All day. Pigs? Yeah, all day. The return is so much better. I like chickens, though. I do like them, but they're yeah. just, they're always worried about Fox. Dude, I'll lay in bed some nights and I hear them yapping and I'm, I, I get anxiety and I can't go back to sleep. I'm like, what if I go out there and there's a raccoon? Dude, one time it happened where I forgot to close them up and I went out and there was, and it was snow. I went out, I went sprinting out mm-hmm. and I saw a fox running off with one rooster and then there was two other birds laying there flapping, dying. Oh and it's like, gosh. that's my worst nightmare. <laughs> You, you, don't, yeah. you don't have to worry about that shit with pigs. You just have to worry yeah. about lunatics calling the Animal Rescue League. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right. Um, indoor shot or outdoor shot? This is the actual shot put. Not like nothing nothing else having to do with it. The shot put. Which do you outdoor. prefer? Outdoor. Outdoor? Yeah. Melichowski or Canner? Oh, shit. tough one yeah it's really tough because they both have things i really like and they both have things that i've always wondered why they did them yeah um but i think garrett canner's a little smarter so i'm gonna pick him <laughs> <laughs> sorry no offense about josie <laughs> coon's so mad right now no, actually, i would have chose canner i was like yeah. he's the correct answer hmm. all right he, he competed better under high pressure situations yeah <clears throat> all right Warm, sour, raw milk, <laughs> or store-bought milk? A oh, warm, sour, raw milk, dude. That's what I drink all day. All right. Just wanted to put that out in the open that that, that is your answer. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, that's not even a question. <laughs> when I have when I have milk from the grocery store, I'm like, it almost tastes like it's microwaved. I'm like, this there's just something <laughs> wrong with this. But I can have warm sour milk and not even think twice about it. Clearly. <laughs> for my whole life. <laughs> all right. Is that yeah, it? That's all I have. Yeah. Okay. Um Okay, so I'm gonna preface this with Ch- uh, Trevor's a uh, Pennsylvania Dutch, and if you don't know what these are, they're Dutchy meals. I see. I, I'm. You always say I'm Pennsylvania Dutch. I'm not really that You're, Dutchy. I might not even know what these are. Chicken pot pie or oh. beef stroganoff. Oh, okay. All right. I know what those are. <laughs> beef stroganoff. That was my like. Go to meal in college. All right, maybe I have a PA Dutch. That was like I knew how to make make two things in college. It was spaghetti and beef stroganoff. No. <laughs> and I wasn't eating one of those two things. So I was making a huge smoothie with like a ton of crap in it. Yeah. But. Okay, uh, shot put twenty two meters or discus seventy meters. You're the thrower. I mean. 22 meters in shot. I, Ooh, I was really? shot Ooh. I think I would. No, go. I think I would say 70 meters is more. <coughs> pre- I would, I would think is maybe a little bit more prestigious mm-hmm. than 22 in shot. But I'd probably, I'd, I'd go 22. 70 in stadium though. So you're not like out in California, and you know you're getting. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Or yeah. open air stadium. I just think just because I was a shot putter, I'd want to go 22. But I think, yeah, I think the, the 70, especially in a stadium, would be the more pre- prestigious. Okay. <clears throat> Sufjan Stevens or the Shins? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a really Sufjan good one. Stevens. Yeah, that definitely. was a good one. That was definitely a good one. Sufjan I was Stevens. giggling when I made that. <laughs> okay. Snatch 315 or bench press 500? Bench five hundred. Yeah, of course you're such a loser. But I would, I would, <laughs> yeah. But snatching three fifteen is way cooler. But I would probably still rather you just bench go with the five hundred. <laughs> All right. Um, what's the next one? Pig or sheep? So, <clears throat> well, see, I actually did raise. I've I've never personally raised pigs. We have pigs We've on the sheep, farm, yeah. but I I have raised chickens too. But. Um, I I say pigs just stink. They stink they, terribly. They, really? Yes. Maybe I just don't smell them. Maybe but it's just me. You also only have like two or three of them. Yeah. I bet. There's, I mean, when I, there's more of them together. They make a bit more of a mess. But dude, you you get just the littlest bit of crap when you're oh that's your true. Fingers and it and never goes away. It doesn't go. It yeah. Goes no, away. that's true. It takes like two or three days to go away. Yeah, that's true. But I like sheep. All, really, all we do is just set them out on. I own pasture and they just do their own thing pretty much. They're yeah. really low maintenance. Okay, here's the last one. And I'm I'm interested on this one. You're a climber, okay, you're a mountain climber. Summit Mount Everest or K two. And and I want I just want this to be clear is that the difference is like three hundred feet. And K two, which is shorter. <laughs> It's supposed to be a more difficult climb. That's what that's what I was thinking. I don't, I don't know a whole lot about that, but I I was thinking that K two was harder. I didn't know how how much so, the elevation. But I mean, but you I mean, summit Mount Everest. Mount you know? Everest is Mount Everest. Yeah. Like, I mean, if I was like if I was actually a climber, like I'm sure K two is the right answer just because it's it's harder. Yeah. But like as a nobody, You're who going. no one probably even knows what K two is, like Mount Everest. Okay. Yeah. I'd say All so. right. All right, and that concludes this episode of The Throw Show. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thanks a lot. Peace.